Well, good morning, everybody. It's about two minutes to eight o'clock. So we're just going to give everybody a chance to go grab your coffee, your hot chocolate, your Diet Coke, your tea, as uh, people start joining us on Zoom. Good morning, Fatma. Welcome. It's so nice to see you. Good morning. How are you? We're doing good. You're a little low. Yes. I'm are you fine. just speaking low? <laughs> But good morning. Yes, and we've got some people joining us on um, on Facebook already. Welcome again. If you are watching on Facebook, you are welcome to join us on Zoom to be actually part of the conversation. These are very casual conversations. They are unplanned. They are unscripted. We never know who's going to show up. We never know exactly what we're going to talk about. So you're more than welcome to join us on Zoom if you have something to say and want to be part of the conversation or you can continue watching on Facebook and be part of the conversation by putting in some comments on the Facebook page. We will also be putting links and things as they come up. We, we um, also welcome you if we're talking about something and you know where there's a link uh, that has more information, put it into the comments, help share and spread uh, some of the information that is out there and uh, again we're just gonna be waiting for some people to get on but boy that rain uh sally is really you know we're feeling it even over here in georgia um but my backyard is a little flooded right now but um i know that we had celeste negeve who said you know it's been so nice just to listen to the rain come down and i agree with her it's been really really nice to sort of have that sound of rain in the background, especially if you have to do any like paperwork or work on the computer, that can be nice. I want to introduce and welcome our guest today, Jesse Hool. Hi. Hello. So glad that you were able to join us this morning. Um, you know, and, and for those of you, I think everybody should know who Jesse is, but if you don't, he is the commissioner elect for District 6, and at the same time, he's a candidate <laughs> for District 6. So, <laughs> Jesse, I think, you know, one of the reasons why I invited you in the morning, one of the things we try to do in these coffees with Deborah is sort of try to clarify when there are doubts in the community, things that are happening and people are saying, wait a minute, but didn't he already win? What's going on? What happened? Uh, and I wanted to, to just give you an opportunity to have a conversation with me and to you know, talk about, so what's the deal? What's going on? But before we get into that, Jesse, I also wanna give you an opportunity to just introduce yourself. Who are you? Why did you do this? What have you been doing? And, and why did you get into politics? Wow. Well, I, yeah, I thought that uh, the purpose of this might just be to try to wake up together. So this is, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, this is thank you so much for inviting me to join in this. It's been a, a good, uh, a good opportunity to remember what the very early to wake up before it's light out. It's been nice. Um, so yeah, just my name is Jesse Hool for anyone who's watching now or later and doesn't know. And I've lived in Athens for about 12 years and have been involved in a lot of local political goings on. I co-founded an organization in town called Athens for Everyone and uh, I've worked on a lot of other folks' campaigns. And um, the, the main focus of a lot of what we've tried to accomplish, I guess you could broadly summarize as social justice or economic and racial justice. And there's a, a lot we can do on the local level. There are large systemic problems that need to happen on the state and federal level. Uh, they need to be addressed on the state and federal level um, with, with policies that are more to the scale of those problems when we really think about wealth inequality or mass incarceration. Um, but there's a lot of things that the local government has quite a bit of control over or can at least kind of mitigate the harm of those things around. And Athens has this incredibly high poverty rate um, we're no exception to the racist and colonial history of this country and the need to um, make changes to substantively better people's lives, um, as well as build community in a lot of those more intangible ways that are really important. Um, 
And so I saw a need for someone to, to step up in this, in this district and represent the progressive values that I think are uh, a lot of what gives people a sense of place here in Athens. And, uh, and through, I, I think you and I are competing for strangest election in, in a long time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that's what we're really trying to to win in all this is actually who has the most bizarre story later for some kind of book that I don't know if I'll have the energy to write. But it seems like something you would do, Deborah. <laughs> um, you, you have a lot of energy. I, I it's been kind of amazing to uh, to just see how how much energy you bring to things over and over while you've had a a comparably bizarre situation. But I guess to jump into to that while we're here. Um, you know, it started off with me running against the incumbent commissioner, um, and he very tragically passed away three days before the election, which nobody expected. And, um, you know, I left a lot of people grieving that loss and also made a lot of people scratch their heads and scramble as to what the heck that means for an election. Um, and there's a, a state law that basically says if you withdraw or are disqualified or, or die, then you're not eligible for office uh, and, and any votes that are cast are, are voided. Um, so that made me the winner of that election by default. And then we were fairly immediately um, sued. It's kind of a, a group of folks that's been led by the chair of the Republican Party in town. And, uh, and that suit is now before the Supreme Court, which I believe yours is as well, right? So. Yeah, a couple of days ago. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I don't know, there's too much in common here, Jesse. Um, so, yeah, I, I find myself, in addition to kind of waking up this morning and enjoying the, the rain and, uh, forgive my being less articulate than I think I usually am once I've had more coffee. Uh, but uh, I find myself mostly marveling at the the complete inability we have to um, really predict what's going to happen in a given year. You know, I think the 2016 election caught a lot of people off guard, uh, especially in terms of the presidential election. And then I think the 2018 election locally maybe surprised a lot of people where we, we saw this just like across the board win of progressives for local office here in Athens. Um, and I guess we don't know yet how 2020 is gonna surprise people, but it's certainly been a barrage of curveballs, I think for you and I, so. Um, so I guess my concluding thought, and then I'll hand this back over to the others on the call is, um, if, it, if it's been anything, it's been humbling. I've always been kind of, puzzled sometimes at how people will use that word when they end up in a position of power or something. Um, but wow, does that really feel true right now? Like I, <laughs> if, there, if there's any way to enter into a position like this and really feel like I need to be of service, um, it's, it's, it's in these times. So, so that's kind of the position I'm coming in, coming from right now. Well, thank you so much. Um, and I think you know, another reason that I wanted to have a conversation with you is that I wanted, you, you know, your example, right, of what happened. I, I wanted the community to be able to have a conversation about it because we've been hearing a lot from certain people. We've been hearing about a lawsuit. Um, Jerry Naismith, who was the commissioner incumbent who um, tragically died. I mean, and I think that he had been in that role for so long. He had been in the community for so long. It, it took a lot of people sort of for a loop. What do you mean? He's, you know, you Saturday, he's doing something. Sunday morning, you wake up to the news that he died. And I, a lot of people just and then in three days, there's an election. So I think there wasn't a lot of time for anybody to process anything that was happening, right? And it mm -hmm. brought in yeah. a lot of uncertainty into a process that let's admit democracy is messy, <laughs> yeah. right? That this whole process of voting and campaigning and you know we're seeing a lot of dirty games being played this time and I think it's just going to increase as we get closer to November. But one of the things that impressed me so much about you, Jesse, that when all this was coming down, 
you sort of took the position of, look guys, this is happening to me too. I did not make this happen, but I hear you. And you reached out to the community immediately, right? To, you had meetings with the friends of Jerry Naismith. You guys had conversations. You were like, listen, I hear you. I know nobody wanted it to come this way. I'm sure you wanted one clean victory and that was it, right? Yeah, I think the, the, the line that began uh, our kind of official statement and a lot of things, just n nothing about this election has got the way uh, we predicted or, or could have anticipated. And, um, I, you know, I think there's a lot of folks who are still honestly grieving. And one of the things I was really cautious of is how much, you know, when someone dies by surprise, um, if someone dies at all, but especially when it's by surprise, I think there's just a lot of emotions that come up to process and you kind of, people talk about like the cycle of grief, but it's more like you're kind of rapidly moving through these different emotions, um, anger and despair and disbelief. And, um, and when someone's in a public position, I think um, it, it becomes that much harder to really give space to grieve that loss because you're also navigating the the public things that are swirling around it and all the all the people's opinions about what should be happening you know um so actually my initial response uh and i appreciate you highlighting you know i i really do have an inclination to engage but um, my initial response was to really try to step back um because i was thinking about the people who were closest to Jerry as a person, you know, which includes a lot of people in public office and such, um, but also like his family. And to not want to add to the noise of what does this mean for an election and things like, we'll figure that out. Um, it was kind of my my thought on that, you know, we'll see what happens on, on Tuesday. It was like you said, Sunday when we all get the news. Um, and that immediate Tuesday was election day. Um, and then we'll kind of go from there. But I, I mostly wanted to give space for people to process the, the human component of all this, which is something I think is like too often lost when we start talking mm -hmm. about these systems, especially uh, the competitive electoral arena. Um, and uh, I, I also think that, uh, you know, Judge Drake, the county attorney, his letter um, explaining, you know, what was going on and, and why uh, the Board of Elections did what it did by the county's done what it's done um, because of the state law. Um, he, he used the term genius of democracy. Um, and as flawed, as imperfect, as in need of major fundamental improvements, as I think you and I both agree, our political and judicial system are, um, there is a lot of precedent and it does give us an ability to sort of move forward, even though sometimes that can be really uncomfortable. Um, and and so there was precedent for this scenario um and there is a law on the books that applies and i totally understand why that can be really confusing and upsetting for people i don't think it's going to stop being that way in part because <laughs> you know when someone dies it just never stops being upsetting and uh and so i'm, I'm trying to do my best to sort of respect that while also respect the need that we have to have someone representing a district who uh but, you know, it's had a vacant seat for months. So. And thank you for that. I mean, I think it's, it's such a breath of fresh air to see, you know, a politician really address the humanity of this, right? And um, it is, you know, Jerry was a friend <laughs> and, and you and I have spoken about this and I, I actually spoke at a memorial for him he was a supporter of mine. We worked on different things together. Um, you know, I didn't agree with everything that he did or said. He didn't agree with everything I did or said. But I think that's part of this process, right? That not everybody agrees with everything. And, and it's through those disagreements that the process is set up to get an even better solution than either one person would have. Um, but you know, you're going through a lawsuit. I'm going through a lawsuit. These are lawsuits about 
the law, not lawsuits against a person. And I think that's really important, right? Um, I think when, when people start making that personal or start attacking the people who are fighting for that, right? I think it then becomes detrimental to the community in that way. Um, but it doesn't mean that we don't fight these laws, right? I think you agree that the law, the way that it stands in your scenario is very unsatisfactory to the voters and to what democracy means, right? I believe that the law being used in my scenario is unconstitutional mm -hmm. because it takes away the right of, of the people to vote. And so we're, we're in this, not necessarily because we want it to be, but because of circumstances that occurred to mm -hmm. us. Um, and, and so we're in it. I had a hearing on Tuesday because we were the first hearing in the federal court. We were granted the motion. So the election got put on the ballot. Yay. So if you get your early ballot, you're going to see my name on it under district attorney. We fought hard for that along with the other plaintiffs. I'm not the only plaintiff on that um, case, even though my name becomes, right, it's Gonzalez v. Kemp, but there's actually five plaintiffs on the case, all representing voters. This is a case about voter suppression. That's what's being argued, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we won, uh, and the governor appealed. He's appealed a couple of times. Each time we keep, he keeps getting denied. So the election stays on Tuesday though. We had a hearing at the Georgia Supreme Court uh, who were asked by the 11th Circuit to certify the question of whether that 2018 law is constitutional or not. Um, so we now wait <laughs> for those nine justices uh, to decide, right, whether it was constitutional or not and whether we have an election still or not or whether they will void whatever results happens in the election. Right? Oh, wow. So, this, so their ruling can actually void the election even though it's still on. Wow. Yeah, even though everybody's voted, even though um, they they can make a decision October 30th and then void everybody's vote on mm -hmm. that November 3rd. I mean, this is how important this case is and not just for my DA race, but there are other DA races in Georgia that could be affected mm -hmm. by the outcome of this court. And the same as, as your case, Jesse, where, you know, the outcome of, of your case can determine uh, races for other county seats, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so then we're faced with the issue, well, it's not just litigation, what about legislation? What about the General Assembly doing yeah, something that, about this law? And I think that's where a lot of the focus needs to be. I mean, you have experience being there, right? I'm, I'm mm -hmm. curious your thoughts on, you know, how much likelihood there is to get some of these electoral reforms through, you know, as in, in some ways, electoral reforms seem to me to be a little less partisan an issue than a lot of other issues that can be very divisive along, along party lines. I'm curious your sense in the Georgia State Legislature, you know, in, in the time you spent there of how much room there is to, to get some of these electoral reforms through. Uh, so yeah. my experience, <laughs> You know, I often tell people, you know, once you see how the sausage is made, you get a very different sense about it. It was an incredible experience to see what goes on there. Um, you know, in some ways, I, it, people are right to be cynical about the process. People are right to feel that it's not always about the best for the people in terms of some of these bills. And I saw, you know, a lot of criminal justice bills come through that were not really about criminal justice. Um, and unfortunately, you know, when we look at Governor Deal's criminal justice reforms, which I give him credit as a Republican to put those in that was so um, unpopular. Did it go as far as I think it should have gone? No, right? So, and because of one of those reforms, and, and these are, you know, the, the expression, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. 
Yeah. Right. That happens a lot. Right. We're trying to do the best and we're not looking at what some unintended consequences could be. And so right now, you know, one of the reforms that he passed was to reduce mass incarceration to, you know, lessen sentences so that we'd have less people in jail and in, in prison. And yes, that happened. We have less people incarcerated. But the flip side of that then meant that we Georgia is the number one state for community supervision. Mm -hmm. One in 18 Georgians are in some kind of community supervision. Think about that, one in 18 people, mm. okay, in Georgia right now. And supervision means they could be on probation. They may have served six months or maybe they didn't serve any time at all. And now they have a 10 year probation period. 10 years where anything they can do can land them in jail, right? And, and they so also can't are, vote during that whole time. And they can't vote, yeah. Oh, and so, you, you know, when you look at these unintended consequences, and this was something that I could bring as a lawyer, right, in the state rep, which by the way, there are only 32 lawyers out of 256 elected officials in the House and the Senate. Think about that, only 32. People think, oh, only lawyers run? No, there are no lawyers <laughs> and it's a shame. But every time I read a bill, that's what I was looking for. What are the unintended consequences, right? Mm -hmm. What happens if this becomes law? And it goes as far as they say. So um, I think it's really important when we look at the legislature and you know these bills that are going through what are the unintended consequences, but also what's the motivation for putting in a bill in the first place? Mm -hmm. You know, at the end of, um, it was either 2018, maybe it was a 2018 session, we have a legislator who put in a bill to sort of have an oversight committee of the press, of media and journalists. And he put it in, after he sort of was, um, got written up in an article and it wasn't so favorable to him, right? Mm -hmm. So then he puts in this bill. And so the idea is not that it was a bill for the best interest of the people. The idea was that it was a bill to intimidate. And so some of the things that we have to look at with these legislative bills, when you say, well, what's the chance of something you know, being passed? It depends a lot, unfortunately, on the motivations of those individuals who are voting on it. And yeah, so, right? I, mm -hmm. so when we go back to this but, idea of the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, I guess what I'm hearing you say is, you know, intentions still matter, but it's it's an it's a mix of both intentions and like the substance of what actually comes after. Absolutely. And pressure. I mean, look at with the hate crimes bill, you know, that bill has been coming to the floor for years. It didn't just come because of George Floyd. Um, the Georgia Legislative Black Caucus have been trying to pass that bill, you know, before I was even there. And I know when I was there in 2018, both Jonathan Wallace and I signed on to that bill and really pushed to have it adopted. And it was not. And, and look at the trajectory that that bill had. I mean, in the beginning of the year, when it first went in, then we had these Republicans who wanted to add a whole bill of rights for law enforcement mm -hmm. that would basically negate the language of the hate crimes bill. And um, I think did that law pass the, the law that um, that assaulting a police officer is a hate crime? Yes. So what happened is the hate crime bill eventually passed without that. And then the Republicans introduced a second bill called the Law Officers Bill of Rights, basically. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, it's the same effect, right? It negates the hate crimes bill to a way. And so um, I, I think of how when people get charged, you know, in an interaction with a police officer, often they get charged with resisting arrest or other, other things that, you know, you see someone get beat up by police and then they're getting charged with things like resisting arrest or assaulting a police officer. And so I, I guess I'm wondering how much this opens the door for people, you know, who we know, like we look at communities of color that are already disproportionately surveilled and jailed by the, by the system. How much does this open the door to add another layer of 
um, punishment onto the docket, so to speak, um, by by saying, "Oh, you resisted arrest," and that kind of quickly becomes a, a hate crime or something. Um, it feels very Orwellian to me. But you know, you're running for DA, and one of the things I was actually curious to ask you about was the way that someone gets in trouble for a thing, and by the time they're actually sitting in front of the, the district attorney, they're charged with usually a slate of things that are related or like a bunch of parallel or lesser charges that can also be added. Um, and it seems to me like this this hate crimes bill that um, is being used to apply to police officers is a great example of the kind of thing that could get added on to someone's list of charges. You know, they, they were drunk in public and suddenly they're charged with seven things. Um, yeah. I'm curious your take on how much power does the district attorney have to not do that or to, you know, or to do that? Okay. Yeah. So what I would say is that the district attorney has all the power. <laughs> that is the power of the DA to determine who to charge, to determine what to charge them with. And because we are a county where 97% of the cases never go to trial. The DA's office also has a lot of influence on the sentence that that person eventually will serve because the jury's not there, right? It's, mm -hmm. So the jury is not going to determine. Um, but the same thing happens as you're saying, there's this potential for over prosecution, for over charging oh you know maybe we can't prove what they actually did but let's go prove something right just to get this person in jail even if we can't prove what they've done or let me throw the book at them and then eventually they'll plead to something less you know um, and this is a lot of how we get the one in 18 people tangled up in this system right absolutely and another good example of that are the gang uh, legislation, you know, they wanted to pass a, a gang bill that would, um, you know, just add all of these other parameters. And so again, if you're charged with, uh, let's say shoplifting, and all of a sudden you were with somebody else, and you both wore the same shirt, well, now you're in a gang because the colors of the shirt say so. And so now we can add that as a charge, and it's not a misdemeanor. Now it's a felony you know, and there's all these other ramifications to it, you know, and I have often said one of the issues, though, is that the assistant district attorneys are doing their job based on the policies made by the DA, right, based on the policies made by their boss. And so if you want those assistant DAs to do their work differently, then you have to have a different DA. Mm -hmm. Right. Somebody who recognizes that this is not the right way to do things that we do one want to hold people accountable, but want to do it in a humane way. Right. Um, if incarceration right now, which serves as punishment, is not giving us the ultimate result, then we need to do something different. And I know, Fatma, I think you were going to say something before. Yeah, I'm really surprised the number the percentage of like the the leg i mean the representatives not being like legislate i mean lawmakers or like any relation with law do they have like teams like how do they come up with these laws like are they um i mean we hear like uh, you know some of these candidates are getting lots of money from special interest groups and <laughs> i mean it's just shocking to me that like i mean i'm a, i'm a teacher but i wouldn't go out there and just uh, do something that i have no idea about and just come up with something because i i somehow was elected and then like just you know come up with a law <laughs> yeah so let, let that's a great question and i don't think a lot of people understand how these bills actually get written yeah um, you know sometimes they are, or, or lots of times, they're outside interests who actually write the language of the bill. Could be a lobbying group, could be, um, you know, the, these large organizations for Republicans. It's ALEC. Democrats have something called SIX. These are organizations that sort of create model legislation 
for mm -hmm. certain issues and then try to get legislators to adopt it, modify it and, and put it forward. Um, legislatures also have what's called legislative council. And so there is an office of about 16 attorneys uh, who are there to help legislators write legislation. Um, the problem is, is that many of these uh, legislative council are generalists, right? They don't specialize in bankruptcy or they don't specialize in criminal law or they don't specialize in transportation. And so they're not nuanced in it, right? And so they'll give very general types of legislation. And that's one of the reasons why so much of the legislation then leaves a lot to be desired, right? Because those unintended consequences can come in. Um, when I worked on a sexual harassment uh, bill, I actually went out and got three um, attorneys who were in private practice who did employment law and focused on sexual harassment to help me look through the legislation that was there and to help me write something um, that would help create a cause of action of sexual harassment here in Georgia, which we do not have. We still do not have a cause of action. And so the only thing we have here is if a woman is assaulted in the workplace, if that workplace has more than 50 employees, then it falls under the federal law. If it's mm -hmm. under 50 employees, there's no recourse because there's no law. Oh. And we have a lot of people who work for small businesses, right? Mom and pop situations, two, three, even 10, you know, employees. But under the law, there is no recourse because there just isn't that bill. Right, and so it's something, but that's the way that bills sort of get written. I want to welcome Jackie Satan. Jackie, you're here. Thank you so much for joining us. So as you're listening, as a, as a voter, and you're listening to this whole discussion of bills and lawsuits and and things, what's going on in your head? <laughs> oh, you're on mute. You're on mute, Jackie. I just put on the mute. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I was afraid I was going to get interrupted, so I put it on mute. Very, very nice to meet you, Jay, or see your face in person, and um, you'll see, you'll be, hopefully you'll be seeing more of me, and I'll be seeing more of you. Um, and Fatma, I, I have never met you before, but it's very nice to see you. I'm, my um, focus has been on uh, the ESOL population, the immigrant population in Georgia, plus others who are not accessing um, the internet and what happens with our schooling right now. Um, Deborah Gonzalez will be our speaker at a conference on Saturday on um, virtual tools to use with K through 12 students and adult learners. Um, and so although we much prefer face-to-face -face learning, both in the K through 12 and the um, adult ESL population. We know that we need to be on virtual right now and um, uh, Clark County School District is on virtual because mainly of what the university is doing and the number of cases that are in, in the community. But we also know that um, virtual learning is with us, can be used as a supplement. How can we do that? Um, but all my main focus is on um, reaching out to the population that's not involved in education on virtual right now and how do we reach them. Thank you so much, Jackie. And, you know, so the conference she's talking about is put on by AIRC, Athens Immigrant Rights Coalition. It is called Welcoming, Creating Welcoming Spaces for Immigrant Students. Um, and so I am going to be speaking uh, a, a speech which I've tentatively called facing challenges that others do not face. And I think we can all say that this is 2020, everybody is facing something here in that, um, you know, Jesse, UGA is a big part of, uh, of Athens, right? And uh, we've got some interesting developments and I'm gonna open this up for everybody who's on the call. Uh, first, an announcement went out that they would have no early voting on campus. 
Uh, and that hit national headlines again. I don't know, all this winning, uh, you know, here uh, and this negative exposure, you know, I love Athens and people are sort of seeing this very negative side of it. Um, and people started, it started a Twitter storm about, hey, but you're letting thousands of people into the stadium for a football game. How is it that now you're not going to let the students vote on campus, but you're going to shuttle them to a small little space and put Athens residents at risk? And I think this is a, you know, we talked a little bit about this last week with the people who were on this, this uh, conflict between the town and gown in Athens and people feeling, you know, UGA sort of always looks at itself and not at the town. Um, President Moorhead put out a statement, I believe it was last week, where he sort of said, yeah, you know, you, COVID cases are going up, but it's really not our fault. It's not what we've done at the university. It's because they're going out to the bars and they're going downtown. And it, it almost seems so disingenuous in a way, right? To say, like, it, the next thing I thought about, well, what does he want us to do? Shut down the town? You know, you brought these kids here. You brought these students to our town and now want to turn around and say it's not our fault. Um, they did turn around, though, and now have offered possibly the Coliseum for early voting. And, and I think if they want to do it really well, UGA, I ask you to open up that Coliseum for early voting for the residents as well, not just your students, if you want to show that you're serious about this. Um, these are my opinions, my thoughts, you know, I don't speak for anybody else, uh, but I'd like to open it up. I mean, everybody here lives in Athens. Um, my husband works for UGA. I used to work for UGA many years ago. A lot of people here have some kind of connection to UGA. What are your thoughts? And I'll start with you, Jesse, about everything that's happening. Well, there's a lot there, but overarchingly, um, when I heard you talking, I thought about the way that we describe often like the city of Athens or the University of Georgia. And we speak to just what one or a few people in positions of power or executive authority think. Um, I think it's important to remember that the University of Georgia is actually made up of tens of thousands of people, uh, most of whom are just workers and students, um, you know, their, their faculty and staff. Um, and overwhelmingly, you know, what we've heard from people who work at the University of Georgia is uh, that there's a, a lot that needs to happen that isn't in terms of precautions around COVID-19, having safe classrooms, as well as, you know, as we've seen more and more people organizing with the union there, but also even informally without um, UCWGA. We're seeing, we've seen outcry about the, the low wages, you know, the, 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 the poor working conditions in a lot of ways. Um, and, and over and over again, we see the business of football, among other things, kind of take priority over the well-being of the people who actually make the university possible. And I think similarly with the city, you know, a lot of times people talk about Athens, you know, this idea of town and gown, and they talk about what the, the city government has done um, and sometimes ignore what seems to be more the consensus of residents here. Um, and, and I feel like the, the city is making a lot of headway, in, like the, the city government is making a lot of headway um, institutionally to become better representative of what people want. Of course, it's a, a big shift that we have to kind of try to turn slowly. Um, and I think part of that is going to have to include reckoning with the ways that the town and gown relationship has been, I mean, I, I describe it as an abusive relationship. <laughs> um, and I, I think that in a lot of ways, the people of Athens have been bullied by this large state institution um, to participate in things that work against our own interests. And I think that's something that really needs to, to change. Um, so, you know, we can talk about the specifics of, of voting or coronavirus or uh, wages or, or many other things, but, you know, in the limited time we have in this call, I think like one of the, the biggest, more nuanced things we can do is remember that these institutions we're describing are actually made up of people and a majority of those people um, 
have profoundly different interests than the people who sit at that executive level because of class, among other things. Um, and, and that when we're thinking of those uh, groups of people and, and defining town and gown, seeing them, it, it's easier to see them as less separate when we recognize that like, well, it's actually just residents of Athens, many of whom participate more directly in the university and or more directly in the local government or things that are independent of government in the private sector and businesses downtown or otherwise. Um, but the more unifying thing here, I think, is that there's the people of Athens, um, you know, regardless of their documentation status, regardless of how long they've lived here for whatever reason. And if we're thinking about the interests of the people in Athens, things become a lot clearer and a lot less like there's this antagonism. I, I want to thank you for that. And we talked about that too last week. And I just want to clarify when I talk about UGA, I'm talking about the administration, right? I'm talking about Jerry Moorhead and those people on the top, because I think, as you say, the faculty, the staff, the students are trying to do much more than what I've seen this administration come out and say. So, Jackie, I mean, you have yeah. uh, had connections in and out with UGA, you served on the Board of Education. Uh, what, what are your thoughts? Yes, I, I've been thinking about, as you talk to Jesse, I would like to focus on UGA and Clark County School District and their relations. Um, and that changes, it's, it's never stable, um, but there, is an antagonism between the two and a lack of understanding between the two. Mm -hmm. um, they don't know how each other works or who pulls the strings in each of them. And this example is um, Michael Adams, the former um, president of um, UGA. UGA, excuse me, um, ran into me at Trader Joe's about two years after he had left. Um, and said, Jackie, can you tell me why Philip Lanou left? And I said- Can you just say who Philip was? Um, he was the superintendent of school of Clark County School District. Um, and it really was quite easy. We couldn't talk, his wife was driving and wanted him to get in the car. And I, I said, I would, I would love to talk to you sometime. And now I can say what I would have said to him is that there's a, a real difference between who the superintendent and the president report to. And the superintendent um, reports to the school board. The school board is elected. Every two years, you're gonna have a different school board. And it, you, what a former um, superintendent said to me is, I can count to five. So you get a new board and the vote isn't there. And Mm. They were precipitating events, certainly, but um, he didn't have the vote after uh, after a, the Cedar Shoals, an incident at Cedar Shoals that should not have happened. But he, Michael Adams didn't understand that because he's appointed by the Board of Regents. And so we've got a Board of Regents that is a state level organization that's appointing him and in the school districts, and this is, I mean, everybody should know it, who's, how the organizations are different, but they don't. And so I was teaching an ESL um, K through 12 class at the University of Georgia, and I was having a difficult time working with the Clark County School District, getting them to place people in practicums. And I go to the head of the department, he said, you know, the school district, it's always been a hard place to work for. And I just stopped and said, you know, there's another side to that story. And I remember when the school district wanted to do studies in the county in classrooms and the school district had said no because they just come in, never give their reports of what they were doing. Um, and so the school district felt they were being abused. And, you know, of course this UGA who is an international organization and has a lot of prestige, right? Mm -hmm. Feels that they can do what they wanna do in the school district. So these things, at one point there was a partnership going on and the two, it was um, the College of Education um, Dean and the superintendent were both named Lou. So we call it Lou Double, Lou Square. And the, the challenge was to create a partnership that would help. 
two years later, it didn't work. <laughs> so there were lots of good things that happened. Joe Beth Allen was involved in it. And we really were brought a lot of possibilities to the school district, but the, the local area is not so impressed by having perhaps a, a full year of school. And they were up in arms because that was one of the one of the possibilities. So there's a lack of understanding, even at the heads of the organizations and mm -hmm. certainly among the people about these structural differences. Um, and the poverty issue, another time. <laughs> I mean, this is, you know, what we're looking at at Georgia is a poverty issue caused by, in, in large part, by the University of Georgia's structure of uh, income salary and the school district all they can do is, is work with people who are in poverty. I mean, they can't change it. So we've got a situation which is structural and no matter how many people yell at us, it's very, very difficult to change. But there are ways to do it. And we're, as we come out of the pandemic, certain things will be clear and they have to change, like the over-testing, the reliance on computers, and the reliance on the companies that produce the computers that want the contracts with the school district. So if I can get my head together by Saturday, <laughs> I'm gonna suggest, I have five minutes on Saturday, I will <laughs> open myself up as a former <laughs> president of the school board and as a em, former employee of the uh, UGA, um, to say some of the things that I really want to say about the future of education. Well, th thank you for that. And I think, you know, education is so important, isn't it? It is. And it's being affected by so many things. And, and education is the K through 12. It's the pre-K, it's the secondary, it's the college, it's post-graduate. And, and maybe adult literacy. Adult it's literacy, it's vocational, family um, education, literacy. it's lifelong learning. I mean, there's so much, right, involved in, yes. in what that one word is. So I want to thank so much you. Much potential. <laughs> so much potential. I love that as a way of ending that segment. Yes. Well, we are coming close to the close of our time together. It goes really fast, as you can see. And again, I invite everybody who's watching, join us any Thursday from eight to about 8.45 to nine o'clock at the most. Um, and it's not scripted, it's not planned, it's who, who comes. I invite people, I am happy when they do come. But the way we always end is I give everybody who does join us on Zoom sort of their last words. They can either use it to give a shout out to somebody um, or an organization, or if they wanna talk about an event, coming up or just some last words you might want to give the people who are listening live as well as those who do listen to the recording after the fact because we have a lot of people who just can't make it in the morning because they're getting the kids ready to school or they're getting ready for work or something else is happening but they like to come and listen after that so Fatma we'll start with you what would you like to sort of send everybody off with um well I don't know if it is it still um available the the exhibit we went yeah it is i'm just checking now um i want everyone um who's in athens to go to tiny um ath at, um gallery and, um, see the gallery and then see the exhibit um by the artist uh jacob Lenska. um it's like I can't imagine how he <laughs> drew all those, um, all those. Oh, you're you're going for you're going to show us. Um, so it's called Ecumenopolis, and um, it's a wonderful art exhibit. They have a lot of um, shows coming up. Um, that was a really nice thing. Um, I really enjoyed uh, going there. So a shout out to all the people who are trying to keep the, you know, art community alive during this pandemic. Thank you. Yeah, I thought I had it here, but I must have put it in the office oh, already. I can go so, grab mine. <laughs> so if you can grab it, that'll be great. Um, Jackie, why don't we continue with you? Any last words? Um, to the teachers who are making the education possible at the school district. 
Yes, thank you so much for everything that you're doing, the teachers, um, the power professionals, uh, the special, there, there it is, thank you. The, and then this, I got like a, he also has these um, little coloring books. Oh. Yeah. Please go. <laughs> they did a, the teachers did, a, and the staff and the, everyone did a phenomenal job this summer once the pandemic, or in March, when the pandemic hit. Um, I was able to ride around and give food um, for them in bus stops and some gentlemen came up to me and said, you guys do such a great job. The community just doesn't know how much you do. So often there's nobody to, nobody thanks those individuals. So I would like to say thank you to all of them. So if you see a teacher, if you're talking to them through, you know, online and the Zoom or yeah. Fatma, who is yeah, one of the teachers, hug, so. to say, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, give them a virtual hug, tell them thank you, tell them you understand that we're all under a lot of overwhelming stress. Nobody uh, knew how or knows how to navigate this, right? This isn't a course that you take before you get your degree <laughs> in, in education. And so we're working through it, but thank you. Talk about essential workers right now. They are extremely essential to the future. So Jesse. All right, yeah, thanks a lot for having me on here, encouraging me to get up. I feel like the synapses are finally firing and we're wrapping up, so. <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, it's been really wonderful to, to chat with you all, Jackie and Fatma and Deborah. Thank you so much for having me. Um, kind of a, a list of three came to mind. I'm going to try to go through real quick. So uh, the first is, I think I would be remiss if I didn't mention anything about the election. Um, the November ballot, uh, you know, many people are paying attention, obviously, to the, the high profile races. I imagine many people who listen to this want to vote Democrat all the way down, and that's pretty clear for most of the races until folks get to the, the last two on their ballot. Um, so if you're in Clark or Oconee County, Deborah's going to be on your ballot in this nonpartisan race, and she needs your vote. And uh, if you're in Commission District 6, I will also be on the ballot, and, and I need your vote. And so if you'd like to learn more about what I'm about, you can go to jesseforathens.com platform there, uh, ways to get involved, different news updates. There's a voter information page that will update as things change, information about COVID-19, et cetera. Um, so yeah, and then you can also reach me at jesseforathens at gmail.com. So please uh, give me a shout if you want to get in touch and talk about things. Uh, the second thing I wanted to bring up is, um, you spoke a little, a little bit to this, Jackie, but these are, and, and you did as well, I, I think everybody did, but um, these are really, bizarre times and uh, at the same time, a lot of what we're reckoning with is the same kind of stuff we've needed to reckon with all along. And it's gonna be a long process to, to make the transformative changes we need. And that requires us all being here for it. And so for anybody who's listening and trying to keep up and probably pretty burned out, <laughs> uh, you know, take some time to just like breathe and hydrate, like drink some, drink enough water, please, and try to prioritize sleep and, and, you know, just these like basic human needs, I think we need to recognize for ourselves are important to keep going. Um, and the last thing I wanted to bring up, I didn't know if we'd get a chance to talk about it, because I said this is uh, unscripted, this is fun, but I've been reading this book, it's called Waiting for an Echo, The Madness of American Incarceration. Yeah. And, um, I think it's fantastic. I, I really encourage other people to give it a look. Um, but it's it's written by a, um, a mental health professional uh, looking at our um, mass incarceration, looking at our criminal justice system, and comparing it to other systems around the world that do exist in the present day. And also uses a lot of data to back up things that we might more qualitatively recognize or problematic about how people are treated and how inhumane a lot of the system is and how many people are tangled up in it, which you spoke to earlier. Um, waiting for an echo. What's that? Waiting for an echo. Waiting, waiting for an echo, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll put it back in front here. Um, and the author? Christine Montross. Yeah. Montross, okay. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm especially passionate about um, mass incarceration and specifically reducing it. Um, if there's something I feel comfortable saying over and over again, even though it sounds radical or something, it's to abolish prison. I think the way we think of prison, the way we criminalize human beings is 
fundamentally flawed and it's something we really need to change. Um, and so if there's something that feels at the forefront for me moving forward about how we tackle these issues of poverty and wealth inequality and racism, um, looking at the ways that we lock people in cages and looking at the ways that we criminalize folks even when they're not locked in cages and, and other them is something that I think we really need to change. And there's a lot of ways we can do that systemically. And so I really hope to get to talk with you more, Deborah, in the coming months and years about how we might be able to do a lot of that together, because I think there's a lot of potential for us to make some real change in a, in a short amount of time. So thanks Absolutely. so much for having me all. No, thank you. We're so, we're so glad that you guys were here. Also, um, before we leave, want to say two things. The Athens Clark County Democrats are having yard sign giveaways again. And in fact, they will do it every Saturday until the election on Saturdays from 10 to 11 on the east side in the parking lot of the old um, closed Kmart. And on the west side where you can see Jesse there giving out his yard signs, giving out information, talking to people from one to two o'clock in the parking lot in the back behind the Georgia Square Mall. Um, so, you know, there are elections going on. Candidates need volunteers. Candidates need donations. I put Jesse's website on the Facebook. So please go there and support. There are tons, tons of candidates, good candidates that we have. Yes, we want you to vote down ballot. Um, and one thing that I do want to bring up, Jesse said that my election, which is a special is a nonpartisan election, uh, that is a little sort of misleading for people because it is not a nonpartisan seat. That is a seat that runs either Democrat or Republican, just because in the special it is listed as nonpartisan simply means that there are no partisan primaries for the seat. It does not mean that it is a nonpartisan seat. And I've often said, even though people say, well, judges are nonpartisan, yes, but not DAs. DAs are partisan. And you know, they're partisan for a reason. And what I usually tell people is that the DA's office is in charge of over a million dollar budget in Athens and Oconee. And that means how they spend that money, how they assign that money, either to keep and continue to incarcerate people at high rates or investing in the community to make sure we can prevent kids from even getting into the system. Those are moral decisions based on the values and either the DA will share those values with you or not. And so it's really important that you're looking at that as well when you're making your decision. Last thing before I say goodbye is that today is Constitution Day. It is the day that our great Constitution <laughs> got signed, okay? And so I will be at the office with my team from two to four today. You can pick up your free copy of the Constitution if you don't have one. It also includes the Declaration of Independence so that you can have that as well. The office address is 337 South Millage Avenue, Suite 104. From two to four today, rain or shine, we will be there and you can come and pick up your free copy of the Constitution. Read it with your kids. You can also probably find uh, the, the text of the Constitution online if you don't wanna go out uh, in the rain, um, but just, you know, stop by, this is something good to keep and, and recognize these lawsuits are going on because of the constitutional right to vote for everybody to have their right to vote. So thank you, Jesse, for being here and, and keep up uh, your fight. And as we go through, um, I'm so proud to have you here. I'm proud that, that you're going to be commissioner elect. I have endorsed Jesse. You will be seeing that graphic very shortly and I'm proud to do that because I think that he will make an excellent commissioner and I can't wait to see what he achieves and how he goes through. So thank you, Jesse, for being here. Jackie Fatma is always such a pleasure to have you in these conversations. And remember you too can join us and be part of the conversation every Thursday at eight o'clock. We put the Zoom, don't be shy. You do have to use your full name so that we know who you are because no Zoom bombing, okay? That's no not Zoom allowed bombing. here. <laughs> No Zoom bombing, but thank you. Have a great day. Stay safe, wear your mask, fill out the census, and go vote down ballot. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks thank so you. much, y'all.